Hi, I'm Heidi Prather, and we're here today to talk about SI joint biomechanics and, and the possibility for fixation of the SI joint. And I'm joined here with my colleagues, Dr. David Polly and Dr. Lisa Ferrara. Hi, David Polly, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Happy to be here. Hi, Lisa Ferrara, North Carolina, bioengineer. Happy to be here as well. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a great topic to talk about with a biomechanist and a surgeon, right? Because a biomechanist is trying to give us the reasons and the why of why people have issues with movement and how they parlay into a condition or a painful condition. And you're trying to help fix the structure so the biomechanics are good. So this is a great topic to be talking about with the two of you. So but I, we open it up with, let's talk about like how we get to the point of deciding that posterior pelvic girdle pain is related to potentially intraarticular SI joint pain, and when it's not. And for the for the description for this discussion, posterior pelvic pain we'll call as below L5, into the you know uh, buttock region posteriorly may or may not have radiating symptom into the leg, and we've qualified it that the patient doesn't have pain with active motion of the lumbar spine, meaning we haven't subgrouped them into a, a low back pain condition. And we've examined the hip and we've determined that there's no intraarticular signs of hip pain, such as groin or lateral hip pain with range of motion or provocative maneuver. So we're describing a condition by saying what it's not. <laughs> So that's always difficult. So we're going to really focus on the patient that we think has primary posterior pelvic girdle pain. So I think we just talk about, you know, when the patient presents, a lot of times they come in pain over the posterior pelvis. And um, in the patient who has had trauma, such as a fall, a lift, a crash, that type of thing, can you, as a biomechanist, talk to us about how we need to think about that patient very differently than the patient who may have acquired this condition, idio I'll say idiopathic, for unknown reasons that are obvious to us. Can you talk to us about the difference in those two patients? Certainly. When you're looking at trauma, you're looking at something that can be potentially catastrophic with respect to the bone, the soft tissue structures, and the ligamentous structures versus something that's more idiopathic, more degenerative, that is, chronic longer term and it's a slower process. It's not an instantaneous, maybe less disruption of the tissue, um, just a longer adaptive change in the stress transfer. So your body is dynamic and adapts to force changes. That's why we see osteophytes on bone. It's a sign that the load uh, and the stress transfer has changed somewhat, and it's basically a marker to indicate that that has changed, and it's your body's way of adapting to that mm -hmm. excessive load, or um, you might have stress shielding where there isn't any load and have bone loss with respect to a change in that force over time. And that's what happens a lot in the degenerative case. That also applies to your soft tissue and your ligamentous tissue too, because they will change over a longer period at a slower rate, adapting to this constant degenerative stress change. Whereas trauma can be much more catastrophic, much more instantaneous, and, and also present with even greater um, defects, fractures, disruption of the tissue. So they're two different biomechanical models, more one such as trauma, which may be more of an acute change versus degenerative idiopathic, which is a much longer, chronic, slower change. And so the range of motions, the micro motions, the um, change in the bone contact of that joint will be quite different as well. And, and even the ligamentous complex uh, for both of those systems can be quite different. And changing the um, integrity of that ligamentous con complex, which is just as important as the integrity of the bone to maintain and transfer stress in a more anatomical manner, can also be altered. And it could be altered in very different ways from a in acute versus in a uh, chronic, more degenerative state. Mm -hmm. so, so I like to think of it, Heidi, as uh, the SI joint has a shape that you think as a keystone arch would be a little bit of have intrinsic stability, but that's really kind of limited. There's the form uh, closure and then the force closure. Clearly the force closure is critical. 
And, and to me, it's all about, is the surface experiencing overload? So there's probably some threshold at which uh, loading of the articular cartilage results in transfer to the nociceptive fibers generating pain. So for that to not happen, to not have that overload, you have to have surface congruity and you have to have uh, form, you have to have force closure from the muscles and supporting ligaments. So the issue in trauma is that you don't just disrupt the joint capsule or the interosseous ligament, you're probably also disrupting the sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments. And so our trauma colleagues do a really nice job of replacing and reconstructing the articular surface, but that's not the full story in load transfer. Some of the times it works really well, but what I see, uh, so I don't see the acute trauma patients, I see the late or cold trauma patients who are still hurting, and so they are having inadequate load transfer, and so the question then becomes, if we provide them greater intrinsic stability mm -hmm. with some form of more robust fixation and fusion, well, will that solve the problem? And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. Yeah. Well, let's let's dive back into this uh, concept because I think this is, I, I find when I'm teaching residents and med students, the concept that's still not quite honed in on this joint. It's just like another joint, you put medicine, if it relieves it, that's the problem, go on. And then we don't think about how it really fits in the whole pelvic girdle. Can you, Lisa, can you go back and talk to us about but what he's, Dr. Paul has already started the conversation about form and force closure across the pelvic girdle, how it crosses from our lower extremity up and from our, our upper trunk and down and the role that plays and that what force closure really is. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Uh, well, <clears throat> and correct me if I'm wrong when you're talking about force closure, I think of it as Stress is transferred top down. I mean, we walk erect for a reason based on the curvature of the spine, the ligamentous supports, with, which function as our tent stakes when you're mm -hmm. thinking about your spinal column as the main tent. And then you've got your stakes to add further support, but can also help load share and draw loads away from um, specific areas, away from the spine share that load overall as a complex. But as you descend the spine, the forces obviously increase and change. And, and then you reach from the lumbar spine, you move into the pelvis as that strong complex. It's going to see a, the greatest amount of force, basically. And it's a transfer system from that lumbar spine through the SI sacral iliac joint, down the hips, through the knees and legs, extremities. So, all of this has to be very supportive, both from loading top down and bottom up, i.e. reaction forces from walking, running, mm -hmm. jumping. And so we're designed to take those forces and share it across our entire spine and pelvis. But the pelvic being, pelvis complex with the SIJ being very, very um, uh, loaded with the stress is, is greatest in that region has a very strong complex of ligamentous tissue that'll help resist the torsion, provide the support and the transfer from the lumbar spine through the SI down the joints into the hip. So let me jump in to add that I think that the, the muscle uh, fascial complex is also absolutely oh, critical. Most and, definitely. And that when we see conditions like prune belly syndrome where they have no abdominal muscle wall, that they're at greater risk because they aren't able to use that transversalis uh, fascia and then the lumbodorsal fascia to try to help control and stabilize the joints. And so the joint reactive force then is elevated. Similarly, people who have flat back syndrome so that they're positioned forward, their center of gravity is much farther forward and therefore the muscle forces to counterbalance that center of gravity anterior translation results in much higher joint reactive forces and again, the overloading yeah. phenomenon. And that that's a perfect prelude into thinking about if they're bent forward because you're changing that center of mass, it's going to continue if you don't have that anterior support. And I always bring it back to, it's like having supportive stent, uh, tent stakes where each one is sharing that load away from the spine equally. If the posterior muscles are stronger um, or weaker than the anterior muscles and they're not balanced and you have that forward flexion, it's only going to continue and progress without balancing mm -hmm. that load. Mm -hmm. So I always think of it as it's more about that load balance, not only of the bone and the discs, but also of the ligamentous tissue 
and the, the musculature, you are absolutely mm -hmm. spot on with respect yeah. to that. And then to confuse us more, when we said we weren't going to talk about the spine and the hip, but the hip, we know there's lots more evidence coming out, like re the placement of the hip or the development of the hip, uh, greater retroversion, uh, greater anterior angles are associated with more posterior pelvic pain. There's also people are now really looking into uh, how stiff the spine is before mm -hmm. replacing a hip. So I think, I think what we're saying is <laughs> that uh, the form closure, which is just how the two joints fit together, is really important, and that can change over time because of shear forces. If the force closure, muscles, ligament, fascia, the intra and extra articular ligaments of the joint aren't fully engaged doing what they need to do biomechanically. And, and that does also, as you um, stated, apply to the joint itself because it's an interlocking puzzle piece, mm -hmm. basically. If, like Dr. Polly was saying, if it's not aligned correctly, along with the rest of the complex of the musculature of lig ligaments, then that's gonna cause significant pain and again, your tissue is going to adapt in that state. It, it's mm -hmm. going to adapt positively or negatively and can cause pain if it's in a negative manner. So everything has to be aligned appropriately to have better balance of that load and stress transfer. And so if I can just say in closing that when we get this overload phenomenon, our current surgical solution is to stabilize the joint where we achieve immediate fixation and then longer term stabilization with the biologic solution fusion. Thanks for joining me today, guys. That was a great discussion.